Well, I've read the passage, so let's go ahead and dive into the, into the text that we're looking at this morning. But first, by way of review, remember, Paul has been telling us that we need to give everyone their due, okay, what we owe them. He started with the government. You know, we need to respect our government where we can, disobey them only where we must, and, of course, support them through the taxes they require of us, since they are appointed by God for our good. And I'll just, just on this last occasion point out, as bad as our government is, anarchy would be worse. So we are receiving blessing, even presently. But he also went on to tell us that we are to give everybody else their due. And what we owe everybody else, of course, is love. And we are to love them in a specific way. To keeping, by keeping them sexually pure, you know, not just in their actions, but their thoughts and desires, by protecting their lives, their possessions, their reputations, in our hearts as well as in our actions, to love them, Jesus says, in the same way that we love ourselves. That is what God's law is all about. Okay. Now, we, Paul said we we're to do this especially because of the time. He said salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. And we looked at different possibilities of what he might have meant. He could have meant the second coming. But that's not very likely. 2,000 years has expired. He still hasn't come. He is coming, by the way. But I don't think that's what he was referring to. He very likely could have been referring to 70 AD. Remember, that's only 15 years away from when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans when God sends his judgment upon the Jews for rejecting his son. So that would be the night of the darkness of the Old Testament economy and the shining of the light of the gospel is coming uh, in, in greater power. Or he could be referring, of course, to our death. Uh, time is short for us. Salvation is nearer for us than we first believed because time has passed and we're closer now to the end of our lives. When the night, our night in this world, comes to an end and the eternal day of heaven breaks on our souls, and that's, of course what we are looking forward to as Christians. Now, in light of this, Paul says, we need to lay aside the deeds of darkness. We need to lay aside all the breakings of God's law, anything that injures our neighbor. We need to make sure we don't leave any room in our lives for any of these works of the flesh. And we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on his heart, his mind, his purpose to glorify God, his way of doing things. And put on the armor of light. We need to equip ourselves with that armor. Remember, we looked at that in the evening. We need to have his truth in our minds and in our hearts. We need to have Christ's righteousness clothing us, that imputed righteousness, that credited righteousness we receive by faith because it protects our spiritual vital organs, right? Without Christ's righteousness, we are vulnerable to eternal damnation. We need to have the conviction that the gospel is true, we're not going to suffer. We're not going to fight for him unless we actually believe these things to be true. That it's the only way that we can be reconciled to God. By the way, I'm going through the armor if you don't recognize it. We need to trust in God's promises to overcome the attacks of the enemy. When he sends one of his fiery darts, the promises of God needs to extinguish those attacks. We need the assurance that we belong to him, you know, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to trust in Him. We're never going to be assured. But we also, as I've said in my prayer, need to see the evidence of His love in our lives if we are to know that we truly do belong to Him. We need the ability to use God's Word skillfully in not just in broad ways, but also in very narrow and specific ways because remember the word for the sword there really refers to a very short dagger that's used for very you know, close battle. So we have to use it skillfully, and perhaps Paul had in mind there the idea that, you know, that a lot of this battle is going on within ourselves. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, we need to recognize those thoughts which are dishonoring to Him, and we need to extinguish them and think what we really know is pleasing to Him. And lastly, he said we need to pray continually for ourselves and each other so that we might be able to stand against the attacks of the evil one. All right, well, that's what we looked at last week. This morning, Paul is continuing to exhort us, obviously, to love 
each other, this time showing us how we are to manage our differences in matters of Christian liberty. Okay, liberty, those are areas where we're free to do what we believe is right. There's no, perhaps, you know, commandment that, that uh, you know, that governs that. It's kind of like, you know, if I have a choice between an apple and an orange, will I be sinning if I take one or the other? <laughs> no. No. Unless you believe one is sinful, okay, then no, you can't. You only, you only have to take the one. But matters of Christian liberty. How do we manage those so that we don't tear each other apart by our differences of opinions? Well, Paul gives to us three principles that we need to apply. The first one is in verses 1 through 12. We are to accept each other in Christ regardless of our opinions, not to be crit critical and judgmental. The second principle in verses 13 through 23, we are to be careful not to stumble each other with our freedom. This one, very important. And then thirdly, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, we are to use our freedom to strengthen each other. Rather than to please ourselves, use it to please our neighbor the way that Jesus did. Okay. So, a lot of ground to cover, a lot of details in here, but I don't think, you know, Paul does repeat himself a number of times, so I'm going to try to condense it a little bit so we get the point. That's the most important thing. So, first of all, we need to accept each other in Christ. Paul knows that we're going to have differing opinions. But even so, we still need to love each other, accept each other, and not condemn each other. Now, you know, the, the applications are very broad. Now, Paul, though, narrows it down to just those things that have to do with matters of Christian liberty. But we do need to remember that even as Christians, we still differ on matters that are doctrinal, that are important. But let me just say this in passing, because that's not what the sermon is about. But if we do happen to have these differences, and they don't strike at the heart of the gospel, they don't make us heretics to believe that those things are true, we still need to accept each other and not condemn each other if we honestly believe that the things we believe come from the Word of God. Okay, so the differences of opinion there too. We still need to make sure we love each other and accept each other, okay? And I'm talking about pre-mill, post-mill, all-mill. I'm talking about, you know, when are we going to be raptured? Uh, and even the issue of Calvinism and Arminianism, okay? We can, you can have, you know, people can be believing these different things. If they're trusting Jesus, they're saved, okay? That, that's, that's the important thing. And if, if they're saved, they're brethren, and we need to love them, okay? We need to love them. Okay, but here he's talking about matters of Christian liberty. Now, if we're to love them in, in these more important matters, how much more in these things that we have some liberty to disagree? Now, Paul gives us two examples of what he's talking about. The first one has to do with food. The second one has to do with the observance of days. And again, I, he's talking here about matters of Christian liberty because none of the things he mentions here are necessarily wrong in themselves. What would be wrong is how we treat each other because we may have different opinions. Okay. So first he says one may have faith, one may, may have freedom to eat anything. And I think he means here, you know, meat and vegetables. Okay, you can have meat and vegetables. But another person may believe that they can only eat vegetables, okay, that that's the right thing to do. Now, let me ask you, is there anything wrong with either of those positions? Is there anything in the Bible that says you must eat only vegetables or you must eat, you must eat meat and vegetables? No, okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Before the flood, we know that, and, and I think you would agree with me on this, that God had given to man the ability to eat really only vegetables before the flood. And specifically, when they get off the ark, and that's probably after the animals had a chance to procreate a little bit, you wouldn't want to eat the only members of the species, right, after they get off the ark. But he gives them right to eat the animals, I know it's going to offend some animal activists and you know, animal rights activists, but, but that's the way it is, isn't it? God says we can eat animals because they're animals. And by the way, we're not animals, okay? We're not mammals. We may have things in common with what God has made 
the animals like. We may have bodies that are made of flesh and blood, but we're not animals, and that's why we can eat animals and why we shouldn't eat man, why cannibalism is, is wrong. Okay, so before the flood, it was vegetables only. After the flood, he also gave permission to eat the animals. So the, the question is, why would there be any debate? That, that seems to be perfectly clear. Why would a person that struggle and think that it's wrong to eat meat? Well, it's likely because the meat in question comes from temple sacrifices. Okay, that's the issue that Paul was addressing in 1 Corinthians. And the, the Christians in Corinthians had some real questions about that. Some believed that they had the freedom to eat this meat because they knew that the idols that those animals were being sacrificed to were really no gods at all. It was just a fiction. So there's nothing different about this meat than any other meat. And Paul agrees. He, he says, yes, you, you can eat that meat. But there were others who had difficulty with that, perhaps because they came out of idolatry and they remember what this was all about and their conscience just was not clear that they didn't feel right, you know, eating this meat that came from an animal sacrificed to a false god. So that's where the debate is, okay? Can I eat this meat? Can I not eat this meat? Do I have this liberty? Do I not have this liberty? And then secondly, there was this disagreement about days. Some regarded every day the same, no special days, but others treated certain days as special. Now, I don't have time to get into it right here. I do not believe Paul here is referring to the Sabbath day when he talks about these days. But I think he's talking about matters of Christian liberty, which would be what to do with the Jewish ceremonial feast days. Those were matters of Christian liberty. If you, if you read the Bible carefully, you'll, you'll notice that Jewish believers, you know, those that had come to Christ could still keep the traditions. They could keep the customs of the Jews. We see Paul making a vow, which was a, a vow of the Nazarite. It had to do with cutting your hair when you're done. You know, he, he made this vow and, and he carried it out. And we see also in the book of Acts that at James' request, uh, Paul went to the temple and he paid for four Jews who were under a vow and he did that to show the Jews that he had not abandoned the ancestral traditions or the customs. He also had Timothy circumcised. Remember that? The Lord allowed these things um, as long as they did not begin to trust in those things for their justification. Because remember what he says to the Galatians. I say to you, if you receive circumcision... Christ will be of no benefit to you. You have fallen from grace. You've fallen away from Christ. Well, how can he have Timothy circumcised and yet tell the Galatians that you're falling away from Christ if you get circumcised? It's because of why the Galatians were being circumcised. It's be they believed, as the Judaizers were teaching them, that you needed to be circumcised to be right with God. And you needed to keep these customs or these traditions to be accepted by God. That is works, work salvation. But to do these things because they're customs it is not trusting those things for salvation. It's not adding anything to the work of Christ. That, that's the difference. So Paul's talking about simply keeping the traditions. And again, there's nothing wrong with either position here. You can you know, observe these days or, or not observe these days. But now the question comes, what often happens when you have two believers that disagree on an issue like this? Well, sadly, they often argue over who's right and who's wrong, who's being faithful, who's being unfaithful. And they criticize each other. And sometimes these battles get heated to the point where maybe they write each other out of the kingdom. Okay, well, Paul tells us that we need to respect each other's convictions in these areas. First of all, because God accepts both of us or all of us if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We're all part of the same family. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all under the same obligation to love one another and not to divide. Again, what was the message between, what was behind Paul's letter to the Corinthians? Was he taking, you know, making the, the, the word of God a whip to them and to punish them? 
for their varied opinions. No, he was trying to unify them again because they were so divided over so many things and things they should not be divided over. The Lord wants unity. So, God accepts us, so we should accept each other. Secondly, he says, God is the one who's going to judge, not us. We stand or fall before him, not each other. We will give an account to him. So rather than turning our eyes on each other to criticize each other for our opinions, Paul is saying, turn your eyes on yourself. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are we doing due diligence? Okay, are we studying God's Word to know what it is He wants from us? What is the right? What is the wrong? Are we convinced that what we believe is right and we're convinced because of the Word? And are we living according to our Bible-based convictions? Are we doing these things because we love the Father and His Son? Because really our lives need to be, we need to see that our lives are really wrapped up in Him. Our lives are to be lived for God. If we are to die, we are to die for Him because we belong to Him. We stand or fall before Him. We give an account to Him. Jesus died and rose again that He might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. And what that means is we are accountable to Him, whether we're in this world or in the world to come. In either place, we'll have to give an account to Him. So what He's saying is, we should focus on our relationship to Him and not on our relationship to our neighbor in these matters. Now, again, let me just remind you, Paul is speaking about matters of Christian liberty, freedom, areas where we can differ from each other. He's not talking about doctrines we need to believe, duties we need to perform. He's not saying one can believe in the Trinity and the other can deny the Trinity and you need to respect that. No, that, you can't do that. And he's not saying one of you can think adultery is wrong and others can think it's okay. No, those are clearly, you know, matters of uh, their moral issues of right and wrong in Scripture. So there will be times when a brother or sister or, our, or we ourselves fall into sin and we need to come to them, <laughs> you know, judge in a certain sense, are they doing what's right or doing what's wrong? Are they believing the truth or believing in error? We need to make a, a judgment, an evaluation. And then we need to respond appropriately, admonish them, rebuke them, encourage them to do what's right. But let's not forget that even when that happens, okay, when we have to do that, people don't like it. Okay? Nobody likes to be admonished. Nobody likes to be told, they're believing something wrong or doing something wrong, okay? When we do it, we do need to make sure that we treat each other in the way we would like to be treated. If we were in that situation and somebody was coming to us, what would we want them to say to us? We need to approach them in a spirit of gentleness and in love. And that's in the areas where we need to do that. But Paul's talking about areas where we don't need to do that. We simply need not to criticize them, okay? Now, secondly, we need to be careful not to stumble each other with our freedom, okay? We're not to judge, criticize, and neither are we to injure each other with our liberty. Now, <clears throat> Paul, um, the problem that Paul is addressing here is the matter of conscience, okay? There's two ways we can sin against God. We can either break the commandments, which are clearly wrong, clearly sinful, or we can do something that isn't wrong, but we believe it's wrong. And so when we do it, we're actually sinning, okay? And I hope that makes sense. Let me give you an example. I had a professor in college who once said this. He says, it's not a sin, in most cases, to drink a chocolate milkshake. You know, for some of us, it might be allergic to chocolate. Maybe it's bad for us. Health won't bear it up. But for most of us, there's nothing wrong with a chocolate milkshake. It's very enjoyable. But he said, if you believe that it's wrong, if you believe it's a sin, maybe you were raised in a household, a Christian household, and your parents taught you your whole life, chocolate milkshakes are sinful. You can have strawberry, but not chocolate. Well, it could happen. For you, 
It's sin if you think it's wrong, okay? You're doing something that you believe God doesn't want you to do. You're doing something you believe he hates. That is sin. That's why we need to be able to do it in faith, knowing that it's okay, knowing that it's right, knowing that it's good, knowing that God gives us liberty. Now, Paul applies this to the food issue. Let's say we have faith that we can eat meat, but we eat it in front of somebody who believes that it's wrong, who believes that they should only eat vegetables. Okay, two things can happen. The first thing is we can offend them. Okay, this, have you ever heard of the tyranny of the urgent? You know, no, the tyranny of the weaker brother, okay? That's where the weaker brother says, I'm a weaker brother, I think what you're doing is wrong, and so you shouldn't do it because I think it's wrong, okay? That's where the weaker brother is controlling you by, your, by you know, their convictions, and it's wrong for them to do that. You know, Paul's already said you shouldn't criticize or condemn anybody if they happen to differ with you on matters of Christian liberty. That's not what he's talking about here. You know, we could offend them, um, and let me just say this, if it could potentially offend somebody, your, your exercise of liberty, I think the best thing to do would be to do what Jesus does, just don't do it, okay? Don't exercise your freedom in front of them and start a fight, <laughs> okay? But there's something more serious that could happen here, and this is what Paul is talking about. We could stumble them, and he's, he's not talking about offending them here, he's talking about making them sin, Okay? If our eating meat tempts a weaker believer into eating meat while they still believe it's wrong or it's a sin to do it, but they do it because they respect you and they know you're a stronger brother and, and you've been in the faith for a while and, and your example encourages them to do it and they do it, but they're still not fully convinced that they can do it, okay? then we've injured them by tempting them and by their eating, they have sinned. And Paul says, instead of building them up, we're actually destroying them. Destroying them. Now, is Paul saying that by our doing this, we're going to, you know, cause them to end up in hell? Well, he can't mean that because, uh, you know, true believers can't be lost. He could be saying, though, here that we could be tempting a professing believer, somebody who isn't genuinely saved, to do something that leads them away from God. But uh, other than that, the only other thing it could possibly mean is that um, we're leading a true believer to do something that might end up in excommunication. Because that, you know, it sounds kind of strange, but if somebody is doing something that they believe is wrong, and they practice that thing, then they're still continuing in sin, and it has to be addressed just like any other sin that would have to be addressed. If we continue to disobey the Lord, then that issue needs to be dealt with with church discipline. And let's not forget, church discipline is not to punish. Church discipline is to reclaim, is to get them to turn around and get back into the path, okay? But again, his point is this, never to tempt anyone, professing, believing, unbelieving, to do anything that is either truly sinful or what they believe to be sin. If we use our liberty in this way, then our, the thing that we consider to be good is going to be viewed as evil. If the world sees us treating our brothers and sisters in Christ this way, they're going to think that we're evil and we're going to be a poor witness of Christ. We're going to be the very opposite of what we want to be and do the opposite of what we want to do. Paul reminds us the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of eating and drinking. These things really aren't important. We should be able to give them up if we need to. It's a kingdom of righteousness, okay, where the members are pursuing holiness and righteousness in serving the Lord, who are promoting peace and harmony with each other, and through that, experiencing the joy of the Holy Spirit as we walk in the ways of the Lord. Paul says, if we walk in love, not only will this be pleasing to God, but everybody who sees us, including those outside the church. You know, there are people outside the church that saw that unity and that love that was going on in, in those examples where it actually was, 
And they wanted something like that. It became something that would draw them to Christ, although if they looked at the church of Corinth, they probably wouldn't uh, feel the same way. They'd say, Why would I want to be a Christian? I mean, they're, they're more divided than we are. Okay, so we need to seek to be unified so the world will have the witness of Christ that he desires to give them. And so Paul concludes this point by saying, let us pursue peace and the building up of each other and not tear down God's work for the sake of food, for the sake of food, you know, to destroy the body of Christ or any other Christian freedom, whether it's meat or wine or anything else that can potentially stumble, okay? When, when you realize that you're at odds with somebody, don't, you know, don't sharpen that arrow and, and drive it into them. You know, that, that's our tendency, I think, as young believers is we want everybody to agree with us. Well, that kind of thing can divide the body of Christ. We need to make sure, especially in matters of Christian liberty, that we use our liberty to promote peace. To do otherwise would be to dishonor God. So if somebody is present who might be stumbled by what we allow ourselves to do, then let's do that thing in private instead of publicly. And only if we can do it by faith. Remember, if we're still doubting whether it's right or wrong, whether it's good or bad. And, and remember, it, it doesn't have to be just in and of itself, but also maybe uh, my, my interaction with it, how it affects me. I mean, my background, all these things come into play. If I'm not fully convinced that I can do this thing, then I shouldn't do it because to do it would be sin. Okay, blessed is the person who does not condemn himself in what he allows. Now, finally, and very briefly, Paul tells us that we should use our freedom to strengthen our brethren. So don't criticize them, don't stumble them, but instead serve them. You know, build them up. We're not to please ourselves, but to please our neighbor, to do what is good for them, you know, to help them grow in godliness. And, and our example, Paul says, not surprisingly, is Jesus. What did Jesus do when he came into the world? You know, was, was he like Solomon, living in the lap of luxury, trying every possible pleasure that he might pleasure himself with, you know, with gold and servants and all these other things? Well, if anybody in the universe probably had the right to do that, it was Jesus. You know, he's the king of the universe. He should have all these things. It all belongs to him. But that's not what he did. He gave it all up in order that he might please his father, in order that he might please us. So he set those things aside to suffer and to die for our salvation. And in doing this, what was written in the scriptures, you know, the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen on me. He was simply... Paul was quoting the, the psalmist who was pointing forward to Christ saying that these things were written to give us an example so that we too might have hope. Okay? And we think about, well, what does that mean? Well, if we follow the example of Jesus Christ and give up pleasuring ourselves in order to please somebody else, in order to encourage them, strengthen them, build them up and not stumble or offend them and so forth, we're we're becoming like Jesus, and as we become like Jesus, if we do this because we love him, then we see that love active in our lives, the love that shows us that we really do belong to him, and we have this hope, this hope of heaven, the hope of being with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in that high priestly prayer where Jesus is praying that we all might love one another even as the Father and the Son love each other, he also prayed, I want those, these who know me, and who will come to know me, to be with me where I am. Well, as we love each other, then we, we see that we also have that hope that we will be with him. And that's the most important thing, isn't it? That we know that we're going to be with the Lord. And as long as we are the devil's tool of division, we're not going to have that hope. But if we are God's you know, instrument of promoting peace you know, among brethren, then we can have that hope. So when it comes to matters of Christian liberty, let's not judge, let's not stumble each other, but let's serve each other as Jesus served us. Well, let's, let's pray, shall we? Let's spend just a couple of moments in, in silent prayer, and then um, 
will come to the table.